in this segment is Darren Thorne. He is a member of the House of Delegates out of the 89th. That's the Hampshire County area. And uh, he is the, I was surprised to learn, lone full-time farmer of the 134 members of the legislature, 100 in the House of Delegates, 34 senators. He's the lone full-time farmer. Darren, good morning. Thanks for making the drive in. Good morning. Thank you for having me. How long did that take you this morning? Uh, about an hour and a half. That's not too bad. No, it's not. It's not an ideal Could commute. Be <laughs> Could be worse. You Could probably be wouldn't worse. want to work here every day, but <laughs> no. you're kind of busy anyway. Right. Yeah. What What kind of uh, farm do you run, Darren? So we've got a uh, uh, cow-calf operation, and we're commercial poultry. How has the weather this summer affected your operation financially? So, well, it started drying up in about, you know, the drought has hit everybody in the state, but... Um, we started drying up in about June, and uh, obviously then we had to start feeding hay. So when we start feeding hay and, uh, and feed at that point, we are you know already behind in in, uh, in our feed. So financially, it, it, you know farmers are going to get hit this winter by having to you know um, purchase more hay, feed of whatever sorts, and uh, of course that's going to be a big hit. And then course in the spring then our pasture fields the way they got burnt up they'll have to be uh probably reseeded because the weeds will come in so bad you were mentioning that you are the only farmer full-time farmer in the house of delegates or the senate and i'm wondering if 20 30 50 years ago that was a bit different any idea i would think so i don't i don't know if that for a fact but i would think that we had probably several full-time farmers back then uh, you know um we had had uh you know um, probably the last 30 years or so since even when i was in school we started pushing for college and uh, we've gotten away from the trades or or any you know any of that kind of working with your hands kind of thing and we're, um, so I, I would i would say probably 30 40 years ago it was a lot more different down in Charleston. The governor declared a state of emergency for the farmers of this state and uh, the livestock farmer. How does that affect you? You're not, obviously you're not growing corn, tomatoes, soybeans, or whatever. How does that affect you? The state of the emergency. The state of the emergency and and, and um, the drought. I mean, you mentioned about feeding the cattle and such, right. and uh, we were talking off air. You mentioned a first cut. Uh, but you wouldn't get a second cut and a third cut. Maybe you can explain what all that means and what the governor's state of emergency does for you in terms of relief. Okay, so the, the first of all, the, the governor's state of emergency that will release emergency funds. He, you know, we he can take out of those emergency uh, uh, funding to help the farmers in uh, whatever they see fit that we can do. Um, yeah, our first, you know, when we talk about first cut, and that means our, you know our first crop of hay or first time we go out in the spring and, and mow and it, like our area we only get probably two cuttings uh, if we're lucky um, from what I understand you go on into the central part of the state uh, you, you uh, might get three cuttings this year we're not going to get that hay crop so um, if we do be a you know if we are able to go out and get our second uh, cut in this fall it'll be late we'll have to wrap everything in plastic um, what we call silage mm -hmm. so um, you know, because it'll be wet, we'll never get it dry enough to do it. And then the crop will be down. You know, we won't get as much uh, tonnage per acre or bales per acre, however you want to put that. So it, it's, again, it's going to affect the farmer tremendously over the next year or so if we're not, if we're not here to try to help. Matt, you had a question? Yeah, I did. Delegate Thorne, you, you mentioned earlier, if you've already had to start feeding some hay to your cattle, and now you're talking about not being able to get the production that you need because of the weather, that seems to me like that leaves a hay shortage. How do you handle that? Where does hay come from? Well, we're hoping that our, our neighboring states will have plenty of hay. Um, I was told the other day by Commissioner Leonhardt that Pennsylvania's had a pretty good year, so we're you know we might have to start trucking it out of Pennsylvania down into West Virginia. Um, now we do in the state have just hay farmers that that's what they do. Of course, they're not going to have the hay crop either. So, um, but but that will help those those kind of folks. Um, you know, over the past ten years we've had a drought in the Midwest, 
so we trucked hay that away so and that we've you know since come out of that drought it's moved east it looks like mm -hmm. so maybe we'll be fortunate and be able to bring some out of the midwest also does that also create a challenge financially it just does. like everything else supply and demand right correct so yeah. And especially when you start talking about the government programs, people like to up the cost because they know the government's paying for some of it. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, that, you know, um, we are, we, the federal government, uh, the NRCS, we're, they are doing some programs to help in the water situation too. So, you know, ponds are drying up. Ponds are, uh, people are worried about their wells going dry. Um, so, so there are some programs out there that has been started um, to help uh, with the cost of these these problems that we're facing, um, which is a, which is will be a big help. But but we're in the early stages of this. is all new, so we I keep you know asking people to be patient with us. We're we're trying, and you know I'm I'm working close with the uh, commissioner and the governor's office and the speaker. Mr. Gilstrap, I know nothing about farming, so <clears throat> forgive the obvious questions if they come up how fragile is a farm to drought for example if, if we have a very wet spring can we survive a very dry july or do, does it have to be constantly wet we need to keep you know we we need to try to get rain uh, you know we we pray for a little rain every week um no so so this past spring as everybody knows we had a very wet wet spring um, we thought everything was going to be good. As a matter of fact, I was late getting hay off because it was so wet. We couldn't, you know, I had a hard time getting our uh, fertilizer on in the spring. And then come June, it just stopped. So then you get 100 degree days, winds blowing. It, it feels like you're more in Arizona than you are in West Virginia. So that's, that's you know, the perfect storm. Um, it, we, we think we're doing okay. Stops raining for two months and two and a half months and it burns up fast when it's you know high 90s up to triple digits we had up to triple digits this year and then the wind now you raise chickens as well does the drought affect them it could it doesn't um the the heat does um but as long as our wells are good and we we didn't have any issues with our wells um the chickens should be fine as, as far as a drought goes. The, the worst thing with them is the heat, you know, trying to keep them cool. I get those little tiny chicken window air conditioning units in. It's got to be very, very difficult. <laughs> well, yeah. well, it's funny that you say that because we've got what they call cool cell. Nice. So have you ever heard of or seen a swamp cooler mm -mm. where it looks like a big radiator and then it's got a fan that's full of water and it just trickles over and then that fan pulls the air across that water and cools off the air. Right? I used to see them a lot out west, um, Arizona, and the real hot, dry, humid, or dry places. So we got them on the side of the chicken houses now. So on two sides, we've got 100 feet of these cool cells, they're called. And yeah. water just drips over top of it. We've got big tunnel fans on the other end of the building that pulls that across, and it cools the building. So it's it's sort of like an air conditioner. Yeah, it does kind of work, I guess. <laughs> it does. My mother tried to rig something like that when we were little kids. You hang a bag of ice behind the fan and just hope it would draw the cool air from the ice across the... <laughs> it, it didn't work. <laughs> uh, same principle. Darren, when does the governor's state of emergency run out, and... And uh, is that something that you guys need renewed? Uh, it, to, to be honest with you, I'm not sure exactly when it runs out, if it has ran out or it's, it's here in the next day or so. It's coming close. Um, we will have to renew that if we can get it through the legislature to uh, allow him to call for another 30 days of state of emergency. Do you guys meet again September 30th? Do you anticipate that being part of the discussion? Yes. Is that yes, something sir. the governor has to initiate, or can you get Roger Hanshaw to put it on a list of things to discuss? We'll, we'll have to do that as the legislature through Roger and uh, Senator Blair. Do you anticipate there being any resistance to that among the legislature? I don't believe so. I think people understand that agriculture and farmers are very important to our economy and to our life. And what does the state of emergency do? just releases funds. I mean, it gives the, the, the um, governor the ability to, to 
get into our emergency funds to help us. Which then means you as a farmer have to put in some sort of an application Correct. and show that there's been loss. And Correct. So, how, how long a process is that, though? Because now you've got to wait. <laughs> yeah, So, and that's, that's an issue that we're hearing about, too. So, so the USDA, um, we all have offices in our counties, and what we're doing is we're signing people up right now at the USDA, and they are going through that process as we speak for the for the help for the water, the feed, the whatever it might be. Um, but just Hampshire County, when I was in there last week, we had um, right at 200 farmers that have signed up for this program. So that's across the state. No, that was just in our county. Just in your county. That wow. was just Hampshire County. So just imagine this going through the whole. Uh, you know the whole state so it's going to take some time these you know there's like our office only has two ladies doing it so you know going through these applications doing the interview process so it's 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 a big undertaking again we just need to be patient um, they'll get to us get to you that you'll get repaid if you're spending your money already on buying hay then uh, it, it'll, it they'll get to you and and it's important that you sign up if you want um, the state help also because we're going to use the the NRCS um, FSA whoever we're going to use their numbers we're going to use their to so we so if 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 you're approved through the um, USDA then whatever we do as a state which which I'm anticipating I'm hoping that we'll do something in the state but there's no nothing written in stone yet where we haven't come to that agreement but we will you know use those numbers so then we'll just automatically take those people in it won't have to go through that process again darren so thorne is our good. guest he's a member of the house of delegates 89th the district out of hampshire actually made the drive in today which uh, we appreciate uh you being the only farmer in the legislature darren uh i think farmers are a group of people who they're not divisive, right? I don't think anybody looks at farmers and goes, I hate farmers. I love farmers. There's, there's no, you know, battle lines aren't being drawn over farmers. We all obviously love farmers. But when you talk about your issues to the other members of the legislature, do they look at you like you got two heads or are they understanding of what you're going through, even though there are no others who do what you do? Well, I, I want to, first of all, I want to make it clear because somebody might get bent over that you know i might be the only full-time farmer but i know that there's other people that have livestock they do farm um gotcha. they but they just have what we'll call a town job or a, you know a, a regular job um yes i think that uh people are are sympathetic to the to the farmers the only thing that i see in in the legislature and, and um is we don't the farmer is not looked at regularly. So it's not, you know, it's something that w when I got to Charleston, I was very disappointed to see that, w you know, um, we're, a, we're a minor committee, you know, you, you have, you only meet in a couple of times through a session, you know, a few times through session. It's not as big on the agenda as it ought to be. I mean, pe pe you know, people forget that um, we can't live without food. You know, and we've got to do more in the state and in, and in the federal government to to support farmers and agriculture. Um, we are getting a little bit away, and I know we like to say we love farmers, and but we're we're I think uh, seen a thing the other day or, or that we're we're five generations removed from the farm, the average person. So when you get that far away from the farm you don't understand where your food is actually coming from mm -hmm. and we don't think about that farmer and what he has to go through to get get that um product to the to the table you know mm -hmm. um so we're overlooked I, I believe we're overlooked not on purpose i'm not saying that the, that the leadership uh, doesn't like farmers because um speaker hanshaw is very supportive of the farmer but um i think that uh you know, we need to make a little bit more uh, noise about it and, and fight a little harder and, and yeah. get, a little, you know, get some farmers, get these farmers the help they need. Out of sight, out of mind, right? Right. And, yeah. and farmers are, uh, like to be left alone. It's hard to get them to sign up for the programs, but we, you know, financially or, you know, we, uh, let's put it this way. I like to, I like to say that, uh, national secure or food security is national security. Mm -hmm. 
and we've we import so much of our um, products today our agricultural products whether that be beef or hog or chicken or or produce that you know it's a dangerous game we're playing um, within the world um, stage that you know somebody could call us any day you know China said you know they're they're the largest pork producer in the country so if there's a call that on us what are we gonna do mm -hmm. You know, so we we just got to look at uh, agriculture as different as being more important. Than I don't know this for a fact, but I'm going to guess that if we had somebody from Department of Agriculture in here, they would say that if we didn't have those imports, then the price of food, which is already skyrocketing, would be skyrocketing even higher. That we have to import from other countries in order to keep prices down. Is that true? I, I don't think that the department would uh, agree with that. Um, me and uh, the commissioner have these conversations all the time. I think what drives up our prices is, is uh, supply and demand. So beef production right now in the state, United States is lower than it's ever been. Um, West Virginia's fortunate we're higher than we've been in uh, maybe ever. Um, but this drought could change that. And when you have less of something, obviously it goes up. Um, so no, I don't. I don't think that's what's driving the market. I think that we... Um, you know, uh, I, th I think we have bad actors. Well, we were talking off air about the Apple problems mm -hmm. that, that we're having now that we're upside down on Apple imports versus production. You want to talk about that a little bit? Sure. So, so that's something we did get uh, secured. Um, the uh, Commissioner Bag had uh, uh, leftover monies from last year. We had the same problem. We had a surplus of apples last year. And um, it was somewhere around the $6 million mark we got through the federal government to, for that program. This, that might have been more than that. I, I can't remember, so don't hold me to those numbers. But the, we had $3 million, $3.1 million left over. So then we had to go through, jump through the hoops, or the commissioner did. He had to jump through the hoops and get this money. Um, the, the feds had to uh, release it again, basically, tell him that he was allowed to use this. And then he had to jump through hoops. So then we secured 3.4 million through our state. The governor released that. Um, that's already been released. And what that pro what's happening there, the reason we're having to do this is because we have a surplus of apples. And we have a surplus of apples because our processors are not buying the apples from the orchards. So, you know, they couldn't get them to answer phones. They can't, you know, they, they, they're just not taking the orders. They're not sending them crates. Now this, I'm learning. I'm just learning all this with the orchards. I'm, I'm not an orchardist at all. So um, when I heard that that was a problem, I started asking questions about what what's going on. So from what I understand, our our local uh, processors have sold out, um, and to foreign countries, and they're importing those apples and the apple products in from other countries instead of buying our local apples. So what's that do to our farmers? Our farmers go out of business. Let the, you know, they have to let their apples drop. And it's, it's not as much a, you know, I, um, when I was, when I was uh, asking for this money, the, I had the question brought to me, well, you know, we need to, or let, maybe we need to let the apples fall and rot or dump them so that we don't have such a surplus. Well, from what I'm gathering from the orchardists, we, we're not, it's not that we have too many apples to sell. It's that we're not getting the processors to buy the apples. And that's the problem. So, so we've partnered with the state of West Virginia. When I say we, the state of West Virginia has partnered with a company or an outfit called um, uh, FarmLink. And what they do is they link these farmers with uh, – customers basically then all these apples are going to charity whether that's uh senior centers soup kitchens whatever um I, I possibly even uh, you know anything that's non possible non-profit these apples will be going to all over the country so so that's a wonderful thing that we've done but this can't we can't sustain this right we don't want to be doing this every year 
and and buying these apples as a state we can't afford it we shouldn't have to so we've got to start looking at different ways to incentivize and get people to uh, think about opening up their own processing it may be just semantics well, but one I'm, minute left here, yes right? i'm thinking farming and orcharding it's all the same so an orchard would fall under this state of emergency that the governor has set forth as well correct correct that's okay. where the 3.4 million come from was okay. the emergency contingency fund all right get, uh, by the way uh your uh office mate chuck hurst uh commented that you're good to share an office with <laughs> <laughs> well Okay. He said, I'll leave it there. <laughs> I think he said you bring great steaks to the office every day. You guys have a little grilling going on there. It smells great. You're wing of the, uh, the office. No, nice. he's, he's a great guy. I really enjoy Chuck. Yeah, Chuck's a great dude. We yeah. love him around here, yeah. too. Uh, Darren, about a minute left. Anything else you want to uh, bring to our attention before we let you ma hang out with Mike Hornby for a while? Yeah, just, just uh, want everybody, you know, any of the farmers that might be listening, we are working on it. Um, we're, we're, you know, we, I'm going to do everything I can in my power. The commissioner is going to do everything in his power that we, we get some additional funding for, for feed, reseeding, water projects, whatever we can do. We, we've got a plan. We just need to get it through the governor and, and through the legislature. But thank y'all. Good stuff. Thanks for coming in, man. I really appreciate the drive. You could have called. <laughs> no, this, this was fun. I, I enjoyed this. Well, it was great to have you. Appreciate it. And I uh, hope you get some rain. Thank you. Soon. Uh, we're supposed to. We'll see.